afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, if I can have your attention, please. We are about to start. So um, let me first begin by saying that I'm really uh, honored to chair this session, uh, and even more so because finance has typically been the preserve of men, and now we are a balanced panel, so I'm very <laughs> grateful to Poonam about that. Uh, so so the, the, the topic is the past and, fut uh, and future of Indian finance. And um, uh, it, it's a paper that's written by Ruchi Agarwal. Unfortunately, Ruchi couldn't be here because of visa reasons. And we have somebody very imminent who I totally respect, Surjit, who's going to do the presentation uh, on behalf of Ruchi. So, so that's fantastic. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things. One is, uh, of course, I ended up reading the paper because it very much interests me. It's a very long paper. But I do want to say that it reads like a thriller. It's a fascinating paper. Uh, anyone who's interested in the recent history of uh, uh, India's financial uh, sector developments uh, should read it. Uh, and and, and it's, it's fascinating and a, like a thriller because it talks about the Indian financial crisis of uh, 1819. Uh, and I just want to make one philosophical point, which is, you know, when con uh, countries liberalize, and this is based on my own experience uh, across the world, uh, it is usually very hard to prevent, at least you have to go through one crisis. I mean, many countries have gone through many crises, so I think it's okay because it gives you a chance to learn lessons and, and move on. And the other point I want to make is this, this topic, like, all of the topics that we've been hearing are important, but I want to say it's doubly important. It's doubly important, and, but it's somewhat un underrated, uh, I feel, in, in, in India, uh, because it plays a really pivotal role in development, and in, even more so as the economy develops. Uh, so I would say reforms of the financial sector are absolutely necessary, not sufficient, but absolutely necessary. Yeah. So the second point, so one is the development angle, but the second is the financial stability angle. So the, it doesn't take long for systemic risks to build up in the economy. And this is the sector which affects every other sector uh, because of the interconnectedness. And so we really need to pay particular attention to this sector. So let me now just very briefly uh, introduce you to the panel. I've already mentioned. Uh, Surjit is uh, who needs absolutely no introduction. I mean, he has all kinds of experiences, private sector, government sector, think tank, academic, just name it, um, and writes prolifically. Um, so he's going to uh, talk about, uh, you know, uh, on behalf of Ruchir, and then I'm, I'm very delighted to have uh, Ravi Bansal, who is a professor of finance and economics at Duke University. Uh, he's one of our discussants, and then we have Rajeshwari Sengupta, who's Associate Professor of Economics at the Indira Gandhi Institute. And I, I, I am uh, very tough in keeping time. I just want to forewarn my colleagues. So, uh, Surjit, you have 30 minutes, and the discussants have 15 minutes each, because we do want to hear from you also. Thank you. <coughs> Su uh, Surjit, yeah. all yours. So, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, let me at the outset say, that I'm just filling in. Um, the paper handed out is very extensive and exhaustive story of India's financial crisis <clears throat> of 2018-20. What led to it, and I guess if he was a film buff, he would say the paper is everything you always wanted to know about the 2018-20 crisis, and maybe were afraid to ask. Um, I will try and keep um, my editorial comments to a bare minimum, <laughs> possibly zero, uh, which I cannot promise, but I will strive for it. Uh, it's a bit hard to talk about uh, this thriller without having some uh, editorial comments, but I'll try and keep it, um, as I said. Okay. So the story is <coughs> the severe slowdown in 2018-20. Why? You know, some of the parameters of this story, of this event, is that by the end of quarter four, fiscal year 2019-20, which is January to March 2020, 
India's GDP growth had plummeted to 2.9% annualized, a stark decline from this 7% decade average. In one quarter, this is before COVID, that the growth rate had declined to 2.9%. Aggregate investment in India experienced three successive quarters of contraction, with a decline of over 4%. Manufacturing and construction sectors entered a recession, experiencing negative growth. So, <clears throat> this paper posits that the Indian financial crisis of 2018-20 was a key contributor to this huge, unprecedented economic slowdown. It aims to underscore the pivotal role of the financial system in India's growth trajectory. <clears throat> this is broadly what uh, we will cover. Overview, highlight how financial health was restored um, during the pandemic, and conclude by outlining lessons learned from the crisis and future projections. I'll skip this in the interest of time, but you know what it documents is just the bare facts as to the importance of public sector banks, 54 percent, and not such a small share of NBFCs which will play a pivotal or um, non-constructive role in what happened uh, during the crisis. Okay. <clears throat> the situation has changed much since 2018-20, but this shows where we came from and origins of the crisis. What are some of the key facts to know? Infrastructure lending surged in India during the 2000s due to increasing infrastructure needs. And they have, uh, in the last few years, infrastructure has also gone through the roof. But thankfully, we haven't uh, had the crisis as yet, and I don't think we will. That's my editorial comment. Public-private partnerships thrived with public sector banks significantly ramping up their project financing. From 2005 to 2013, Total bank lending, private and public, grew by 15% annually in real terms. By early 2010s, banking system faced governance challenges and loan misallocation, zombie lending, loan evergreening. Mid-2010s, this is a critical moment in India's attempt to reform the financial sector, and the RBI prioritized addressing the NPA problem via the Asset Quality Review, which was launched a regulatory exercise much needed to identify and rectify discrepancies in loan classification. And you'll see AQR throughout in all of the graphs. <clears throat> By 2016-17, the review revealed substantial underreporting of NPAs, with large borrowers making up nearly 90% of non-performing assets. By 20, <coughs> the review led to 12 banks, of which 11 were public sector banks, being put under prompt corrective action. That's the other acronym, three-letter acronym, that Indians love, and the PCA, which in turn led to a sharp decline in public bank lending. The decline in credit availability created a vacuum. We set the stage for the growth of NBFCs. Action, reaction. NBFCs became a significant credit provider to the op economy, offering up to 20 to 30 percent of the total flow of credit after 2010. And what you'll see in all of the charts, there are some steep departures from the trend. So um, whatever you look at, and that's what uh, really good effort being made by Ruchi is to document that look things went out of control and so you see the big lines going up that's the story post AQR the asset quality review bank lending growth dropped below 3% in 2016-17 as banks consolidated their balance sheets and allocated large provisions for the newly recognized bad debts. This resulted in two major shifts in credit creation. Most new bank credit originated from private banks, which had relatively strong or stronger 
capital positions after the asset quality review. Their share new lending to the new economy, to the real economy, sorry, rose from 25% to 80% by fiscal year 2015-16 and nearly 100% by fiscal year 2016-17. The interlinkage between banks and MBFCs significantly increased. NBFCs operate in niche markets and regions where traditional banks aren't present. So this advantage allowed NBFCs to quickly deploy funds to the real economy, including priority sectors, and setting the stage for the crisis. Banks, both private and public, found it profitable to channel part of the funds to NBFCs, who then lend to the real economy. All of this before demonetization. <coughs> The demonetization episode in November 2016 had two crucial impacts on credit flow to the commercial sector. First, flush with liquidity, because that's what happened with demonetization. Banks had a lot of liquidity, banks had a lot of deposits. Um, the supply of bank credit accelerated in 2017-18, and lending from banks to NBFCs rose from about 0% to about 60% year on year. Now, as you would expect, <coughs> there was an increased exposure to real estate. And direct lending to real estate, the chart shows uh, how direct lending to real estate companies changed, and the exposure of the financial system to the real estate sector doubled. Then comes the ILFS default, the first big crisis. The ILFS was established in 1987 to finance infrastructure projects. By March 2018, the assets were 1.2 trillion, 0.6% of GDP. Increased reliance on short-term borrowing by issuing commercial paper and debentures as medium-term loans were not rolled over. By March 2018, 35% of ILFS liabilities were due to be paid to the creditors within 12 months. Their leverage, 17 to 1. On September 4, it was revealed that the ILFS group defaulted on short-term short loans. Then came the DHFL default, housing loans. <coughs> it defaulted in 1984. Uh, sorry, incorporated in 1984, it provided loans. It provided loans for new housing, loans against property, and construction project finance. You know the real estate story, or the construction story rather, is a very important feature of any developing economy, and we see that sometimes it leads to a crisis. Also advanced, right? Yes. Yeah. How much? You went? Financial yeah. crisis? Yes. <laughs> Assets worth one point, so they had 1.2 trillion. This is just basically the ILFS default was that the dam that broke, the dominoes that were to fall, whatever metaphor you use. Basically, 24 June 2019, DFL, DHFL defaulted, sending a yet another shock. And then, not surprisingly, uh, so this is all intended consequences or should have been thought of that this is what would happen. Uh, <clears throat> after both defaults, there was a major run on mutual funds and a 35% decline in one month in money market mutual funds. Total exposure of mutual funds to the ILFS group and DF DHFL was only 0.8%. Notice was only 0.35% of the major funds assets, only 0.025% of GDP. But that's not what is that critical in a credit crisis. Despite the small exposure, the default by LFS and later by DHFL on their debt led to a major panic. That's the story, an outflow from mutual funds. So it, it was small, but what would happen? Everybody started thinking, when is the next domino going to fall? Outflows from MFS and mutual funds in one month was about 50 times greater than exposure to ILFS and DHL. So two 
NBFCs crash very small proportion of the total assets, 0.025% <coughs> of GDP, and the outflow for mutual funds, stable, etc., was about 50 times greater than that exposure. As you'd expect, credit spreads. Again, notice the spikes, and this is uh, all happening in about, I would say, a year, year and a half. The whole system came, came crashing down. Um, and you can see that at the end of, at the end of 2019, AA rated corporates had to pay about 200 basis points more than AAA rated corporates to borrow in the markets. This was about 150 basis points higher than the spreads observed prior to the default. <coughs> and I should mention, there's a very, very detailed paper. I think some of the commentators said they won't, or the discussants. It's really more than 100 pages, and that has been distributed. I don't think I can do justice, or even Ruchid could do justice through a PowerPoint presentation on what is contained in that paper. But everything there is documented in a very, very detailed fashion. Now, <coughs> this is, you know, story in flow charts, or intended. There are actually about ten steps identified. I will quickly read some of the uh, steps um, that <coughs> led to this, but this, I, I'm sure, well, you can read some of it, but basically it's, it's a story of one thing leading to another. There was the initial shock, uncertainty, and flight to safety. That ran a run on the shadow banking system. That meant liquidity hoarding. The NBFC banks cut fresh lending, hurting borrowers that rely on them. Then that created insolvency. There was not lending, there was not real activity, and the people could not access the funding. And then the fall spread to the rest of the supply chain uh, effect. Vendors and lenders exposed to affected firms, borrowers are hurt, vulnerabilities rise, and that led to a further, uh, if you will, loop of uncertainty and flight to safety. <coughs> All lines lead upwards, as I had mentioned earlier, and a consequence of this was that <coughs> there was a major competition for deposits and a collapse of the monetary policy transmission. Um, <coughs> this graph shows the gap in the weighted average term deposit rates versus the repo rates and that had been for, for since 2014 somewhere around 1% which declined because of demonetization to about half a percent and then uh, after two quarters it started to uh, the defaults happened and everything else and went up to as much as about two percentage points. This is, remember that this is the gap in the weighted average term deposit rates versus the repo rate. <coughs> now, what were the banks doing? The banks were hoarding liquidity by placing it at the RBI. So, further exaggeration of the crisis. The people who could lend found it very convenient, this is what Rakesh Mohan, a form of this, former deputy governor, termed lazy, I think, I <laughs> lazy banking. So they, they thought, a lot more profitable. I can't lend, risk is higher, defaults are happening, everybody's running away, and so on and so forth, so why not park our money with the RBI? So the RBI had created this liquidity adjustment facility in order to absorb the liquidity. That's what the banks did. 
the ex this excess liquidity equated to 40 percent of banks' French lending in 2018-19 having a significant impact. So 40 percent of banks' fresh lending went to uh, the RBI. <clears throat> this, it's a bit hard to read this, but basically let me just uh, read my cheat sheet. Overall, the credit crunch sequence and severity can be broken down into three distinct phases for a better understanding. Phase one. The crunch in public sector lending followed the introduction of the asset quality review of the banks in 2015. The crunch in lending from NBFCs post the default of ILFS in September 2018 is phase two. Phase three, the overall lending crunch following the default of DHFL in June 2019. Now, <coughs> Certain sectors, as it says, like MSMEs that depend on MBFCs were really hit hard. And this shows uh, the composition of credit growth to MSME. And you can look at the uh, in detail later. But the key point to note is that the credit growth to the MSME sector went up as high as something like 20% in June 17. And by uh, two years later, it was down to five, and another half year later, it was down to almost zero. And one can just imagine what the consequences would be. And they were. And the large impact on economic growth, particularly, as you would suspect, in credit se sensitive sectors. This is what I'd said in the beginning, what Richie had said that the real GDP growth plummeted from 8.9% in quarter 4, 2017-18 to just 2.9% in quarter 4, 2019-20. And remember, this is lower than the effect of the great financial crisis. <clears throat> At the same time, contributions to GDP growth from the manufacturing and construction sectors saw a stark drop from 3.2% to negative 0.7%. These sectors substantially contributed to the pre-pandemic GDP deceleration. And that we need to remember when we look at what happened once the pandemic struck. And there was, if you all remember, that the first year of the pandemic, I think Indian GDP growth collapsed to something like 6.4%, which was one of the highest collapses in the world. And we need to keep in mind as to what had happened, the structure of the economy um, prior to that. It was in a, when we were hit by the pandemic, we were in a very, very vulnerable and weak position. Okay. How much time do we have? Six, right. seven minutes. Okay, perfect. Uh, <coughs> now we come to <coughs> some good news. Um, that is a policy response um, during 2018-20 and uh, COVID-19. Liquidity operations, but not directly to NBFCs. RBI injected aggregate liquidity into the system through banks and encouraged banks to channel the excess liquidity to the NBFC sector. So this is, this was not there before. They had, then they were absorbing, they were being dissuaded or circumstances were dissuading here, the RBI acted quite constructively and encouraged banks to channel the excess liquidity. Interest rate cuts by 135 basis points pre-COVID. So this is happening in 2019-20. And mind you, the real interest rate, um, when, you, when you look at the interest rate cuts by 135 basis points, at 2018-19, I think India had the highest real repo rate in its history. Maybe Chetan can correct me, but it was somewhere around 3.5%, whereas the normal average real repo rate in India has been around uh, 1 post-2011, and until 2011, uh, mostly negative. Uh, so this is something unprecedented uh, in Indian history, though I think for a brief moment, uh, 
between 1999 and 2004, our repo rates were just introduced, I think, in 2002. They also had gone up to about 3 4%, which in a retrospective editorial comment, uh, warning beforehand, might have led to the growth slowdown uh, in 2003, 4. 2003, 2003, 2003, 4, India grew at 8 percent plus, and I think that was uh, because of the weather uh, had really improved. Okay. <coughs> so the rest, even broader set of measures during COVID-19, and he very conveniently says, see paper. <coughs> now. <coughs> Financial health restored after years of repair. Previously, things were going up. Now they begin to fall. Bank NPAs fell from a peak of 11% in September 2018 to 4% by end 22. And NBFC NPAs down to 5% by end 2022. And I think they're still lower now uh, in, 23, in June 2020. Stronger supervisory rules for oversight of NBFCs, bad loans, etc. Capital and liquidity positions boosted with capital to risk weighted assets ratio of 16% for banks and 27% for NBFCs. Largely due to corporate deleveraging, lower interest rates, focus on strengthening loan books, and extensive policy support during COVID, which is uh, uh, what has helped restore. Uh, quite significantly the financial health. Some lessons and looking ahead. And this is the last slide. Okay. So I'll be finishing on time. Uh, so what have we learned? And <clears throat> maybe the crisis was an opportunity, uh, as the Chinese phrase means. Finance is, this is a no-brainer, but I think an important no-brainer. The finance is central to most countries' growth stories, and particularly those economies that are developing and are in the acceleration mode. When designing growth policies, important to consider finance. And when <coughs> designing finance policies, important to consider growth. And this may seem obvious, but I think that's an important policy recommendation. Misapplying survival of the fittest to India's financial system hinders and hindered growth. Political economy pressures to not provide government support or liquidity to weaker institutions like NBFCs without considering the macro importance of niche borrow lender relationships, which is what the NBFCs provide and have provided. Rethinking RBI's lender of last resort role. RBI did not give liquidity to NBFCs, creating pockets of illiquidity and large macro costs. They finally did after COVID. And the rhetorical question is why not before? Rethinking infrastructure finance. Infrastructure lending has gotten, gotten, that's not my phrase, has gotten it or whatever. Indian economy into trouble roughly every 10 years for past 30 years. And the last five years, that is 2018 to 20, uh, was the worst. Need for a comprehensive strategy to scale up infrastructure without financial stability risks or large fiscal costs to taxpayers. And this is something that is of relevance now where we have infrastructure has really been scaled up and uh, so far um, things seem to be in control with no. Lastly, but not lastly, addressing funding imbalance to support growth. Banks have strong deposits but are conservative in lending. Lazy banking in some private banks and political influence on PSBs. Non-banks have lending opportunities, but no cheap funding. Significant on lending from banks to non-banks. There is room for arbitrage and therefore room for policy, such that those who need the credit get it available in quantity and at a competitive price the fact that they are not getting at a competitive price, which is the interest rate, whatever, um, is something for policymakers to consider. We'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Sujit. I think you really did do justice to the paper. Uh, let me now t uh, uh, turn to Ravi. Uh, Ravi, uh, if you could please take maybe 13 minutes. 
uh, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, as was mentioned a few times, this is like a really long paper uh, <laughs> to read, uh, and and I didn't read the whole paper. Um, but I, I got some help from Ruchi. He talked to me a few times, and and he gave me like a slide deck that he used to discuss the paper, which uh, which is what I used to to talk about. But I'll take a little bit of more of a conceptual view of the paper because really the motivation of the paper is to argue that there is a causal event which is and then there is like an economic channel that he has in mind and i'm going to quickly go through this so you know in, in terms of banking there is the usual uh, understanding that banks have like a long-term uh, lo short-term liabilities long-term assets and there can be a bank run because of that mismatch in maturity and that the bad equilibrium can be removed uh, through uh, deposit insurance okay and so that's sort of the the, the basic idea that comes into play in his analysis. This is, uh, let, me, let me just mention that the same thing applies to shadow banks uh, in, 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 in every way. So let me just leave it at that for this to conserve time. Mm -hmm. um, there is another margin that comes into play in his discussion, which I would call the information sensitivity and in runs, which is sort of the idea of Dan Gorton and Holmstrom that if you have like a bad event, a bad information event, and the underlying collateral loses value, then the underlying debt loses value, and then that can lead to prices. Okay, uh, so they they it, it can lead to a rise in the repo. The hair the repo haircut goes up. The amount of uh, 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 maturity can be shortened. So a whole bunch of things happen if debt becomes informationally sensitive due to concerns about adverse selection. You think you have a ba bad security, basically. Okay. So then there's information creation uh, for that reason. Um, and then the third, the third margin that comes into, into his discussion is the macro consequence of that, which was highlighted very early on by Bernanke. Uh, but there's a voluminous literature talking about how intermediation net worth shocks translate into like a macroeconomic event and a slowdown in some sense. And you know, this is like the, the great, great Depression event. You can see it lasted for a long time. And, 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 and that's sort of what, what was the starting motivation. But then there is like a whole range of uh, new margins in the last, I would say, decade, decade and a half. Uh, they are like uh, all of these collateral constraint models of Kiyotaki, Gertle, and Moore, who talk about how collateral constraints on, on borrowing and net, wo net worth or net wealth considerations of banks and the ensuing uh, uh, leverage constraints on them uh, due to moral hazard can magnify these shocks. Okay? Uh, so, so those are the three different dimensions that have to go into this analysis. And his attempt really is to try and argue that the narrative that you get out of this uh, Indian episode is it's a combination of these three things. Okay? And, and that's really what his attempt is. I would say that, uh, in, and I, I won't go through this because Sujit went through this uh, rap already in terms of the decline in GDP um, and so on and so forth, that this decline is, is triggered by, um, by, I would say, uh, a, a collapse in public sector lending due to uh, zombie loans okay? uh, that they had. There is a rise in the shadow banking sector as a consequence of that. I'm, I'm skipping through this fast because Sujit already mentioned this in some sense. So uh, there's a rise of shadow banking. Okay? And then there's a big exposure of commercial banks and public sector banks to shadow banking, okay? uh, uh, financial institutions, both, both in terms of uh, their, uh, let me just say there's a big exposure to them in terms of the portfolios they hold. Okay? Uh, I think the most important thing to take away from an aggregate perspective from this is if you combine all the financial intermediaries, there is like a big exposure to, to real estate. Okay, and so that's that's like the main uh, takeaway uh, from this. Uh, let me skip this. Let me skip this. Uh, the uh, the the important event was that there was like a is something going on over here. Okay, so so there was like a um, I would say like a. Um, 
uh, information event, which was like uh, defaulted by the shadow bank, and that triggered a, a run on the mutual funds. Okay, so so that's where the Dan Gordon Holmstrom margin kicks in. Okay, so that is the starting event for that. There is a run on the mutual funds, and then the mutual funds run on the shadow banks. Okay, and then the shadow banks face the diamond dipping problem that they have a maturity mismatch now, and there is a, there is a rollover risk that they face on top of that. So so that is the mechanism that he. Uh, suggests in his in his in his paper, and then he says that's what led to the decline in in, in growth rates and investment in the economy. Now, I, I think I think the identification of the mechanism is a little bit could be better. Okay, in some sense, uh, you could look at the granular data of these institutions and try and identify what what exactly the mechanism is. Uh, let me let me su let me say that what which you suggest is that this is like a liquidity event which became a solvency event. Okay, I think that's roughly the thrust of his argument. Okay, I'm not convinced of that. I looked at and and there are a lot of people in the room who might know the facts better than than I do. Is like if you look at the information. The contours of the land acquisition bill that came out in 2013, it seems, made many of these real estate projects somewhat unprofitable. And I cite the article that I read on that. Okay. Now, so, so there is already like a business risk developing in the, in, in the real estate sector. To me, it seems it was a solvency event that led to a liquidity event. Okay? And the materialization of that can happen as and when the information comes out. Like, why does this interpretation matter? It matters a lot. Because if it's a liquidity event, you're in the diamond dipic world. Okay? And, and you can eliminate the bad equilibrium by liquidity injections. Okay? And that's welfare enhancing unambiguously. Okay? If it's a solvency event, then things get very tricky. Okay, then you have to basically, then you're involved in a bailout, okay? And you have to absorb the commercial risk of the entire enterprise, okay? And in a country like India with, with all the democratic institutions, that can be very tricky if you're bailing out a private entity, in, in <coughs> essence, okay? So I think making a distinction between whether this was a liquidity event or a solvency <coughs> event and the timing of the intervention on that is of some importance and that could be, uh, somewhat better, I guess, handled. Um, uh, what are some of the policy questions? Could, could the decline in GDP that you saw in 2018, 2019, uh, if it was a liquidity event, be <coughs> avoided by a direct injection? That, that would mean like a significant uh, uh, saving of GDP decline, okay? So, so I think that's like a core, uh, what if kind of question, if it was, and, and that depends on whether it's a solvency or a liquidity event. And he seems to think it's a liquidity event. I'm not sure, but I think it could be a solvency event. Like it very likely is. So, um, uh, so more broadly in terms of policy, does the uh, financial architecture over here have like a clear mechanism for providing <coughs> liquidity uh, or like they did in SVB, SVB's uh, bank, uh, bank run in the US? Is there like a clear mechanism to do that? Uh, and, and is that like well established? And then the broader question, which was also discussed yesterday, is like how, how do we fund yeah, uh, infrastructure uh, for, a, for a capital starved economy like, like, like India? Uh, it's kind of a significant issue because there is high growth rate uh, looking forward, which should increase leverage and should allow for more leverage in the economy because there's high growth rate. The growth path is risky. Okay, and so you need like some kind of a combination of high leverage and risk management, which is also called, in a macro sense, macro prudential policy. Okay, so I would say uh, uh, how much leverage you take and how much growth risk you take is a growth versus volatility question, and that depends on the risk aversion uh, of the of the policy makers and, and the country at large in some sense. How how much decline in GDP as an as an episode can they absorb in some sense? 
So uh, let me just leave those as the policy questions. Did I maintain my time because you intimidated yeah. us? Yeah, you have so. two more minutes. Okay, cool, thanks. So, so that, that's sort of the uh, um, um, broader uh, 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 qu question that I have. I think, I think this is a really interesting paper. It is a massive effort in putting the data together. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, so uh, it's really nice paper. Everybody should look at it. Uh, in terms of the particular episode, I think uh, the identification issue of the exact mechanism, uh, I guess, could, could, could be somewhat different and, and better. Okay? Let me just stop at that. Thank you very much, Ravi. I, uh, you know, I, I, I will confess that when I read the paper, I didn't think about this angle, but uh, you almost convinced me about the solvency <laughs> versus liquidity issue. Um, so, uh, yeah, go ahead, Rajesh. Thank you, Ratna. I'll try to stick to the time as well. So I won't uh, summarize the paper since um, um, Surjit has done a fantastic job of doing it. I will directly go to the comments, which are of three groups. So one is about the main thesis of the paper. Uh, the second is about the overall objective. And then I would want to highlight some important gaps in the paper. It, it is an extensive paper of 125 pages, um, covering a wide gamut of issues. Uh, and I did read the full paper. It took me almost two days. So the main thesis of the paper is that the GDP growth of the Indian economy fell drastically from 8.9% in the Jan to March quarter of 2018 to 2.9% into Jan to March quarter of 2020, right before the pandemic hit us. And investment collapsed sharply exactly during this period. Um, and the author's hypothesis is that the Indian financial crisis was the primary driver of this economic slowdown. Now, what is this Indian financial crisis? According to the author, this was triggered by the default of two NBFCs. We don't call them shadow banks in India. These are non-banking financial companies, the ILFS and the DHFL, which defaulted between September 2018 and June 2019. And that triggered a series of events in the bond market, the commercial paper market, et cetera, which caused the economic slowdown of 2019-20. That's the hypothesis that he tries to establish in the paper. Now, the, the first set of comments that I have is that it, it's a very narrow focus, right? And if, if you want to talk about the role of the financial sector in the economic slowdown of 2019-20, you have to take a much longer sweep of the previous decade instead of just focusing on what happened in the financial sector post-September 2018. The entire emphasis of the paper is on the defaults of the two NBFCs and the events that followed after that. However, the, the point that I want to make is the banking sector crisis had a much deeper and more severe impact, which was one of the very important factors which also led to the slowdown of the Indian economy. And what he does in the paper is he, he mentions the banking sector crisis. He doesn't call it a crisis. The banking sector problem only in the passing, almost as uh, creating the playground for the NBFCs to rise. That's pretty much the importance that he gives to the banking sector problem in the paper. But the fact remains that the banks in India account for more than 65% of total credit. NBFCs account for less than 3% of total commercial credit, right? And by the time the ILFS default happened, the economy was under significant stress, which had been building up over a long period of time. And moreover, if we move away from the official GDP data, which many of us know have measurement problems, the economic slowdown started much earlier what did happen was that the NBFC defaults amplified the stress that had been building up in the system. So, so giving that undue emphasis on just the defaults of the two NBFCs distracts attention from a much larger problem that the system had been grappling with for almost a decade before the ILFS default happened. And therefore, causality is, is, is absolutely impossible in this case to establish it's even very difficult to disentangle the impact of the banking sector problem and the NBFC problem, and then give the entire uh, the, the sort of uh, cause of this economic slowdown to the defaults of the two NBFCs. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I want to show a few graphs to sort of refresh our memories on how severe the banking problem was, 
And this was not just the banking problem, this was called the twin balance sheet crisis in one of the economic surveys, because on one side, there were these over-leveraged, very large non-financial companies which had borrowed heavily pre-global financial crisis and started facing a lot of stress after the global financial crisis and eventually started defaulting on the bank loans. What I show here is a graph of, I take a sample of 2,000 very large non-oil, non-financial companies, and I look at the share of these companies for whom the interest coverage ratio was less than 1.5 for two consecutive years, right? Interest coverage ratio is the, whether the company has enough earnings to pay for the interest. And what you see is that by 2015-16, way before the ILFS default, 40% of these 2,000 companies had interest coverage ratio of less than 1.5, which means they were significantly financially stressed. Now coming to how this manifested in the banking balance sheet, it started roughly from 2008. And mind you, when you look at this graph, the stress in the corporate balance sheet starts from roughly about 2007-8. This first shows up in the banking sector balance sheet as restructured loans, because for those of us who, who were around at that time, and I remember, for a good five, six years, the banks were hiding the bad loans, facilitated by a lot of restructuring schemes floated by the RBI. So the bad news did not come up on the balance sheet, and the red line shows the restructured loans on the balance sheets of the public sector banks, which is basically what enabled them to do all of these phrases, extend, pretend, evergreening, blah, blah, blah. And then in 2015, when under Governor Rajan, when RBI decides to force the banks to disclose the NPAs, the actual NPAs skyrocket. Doesn't mean that NPAs were formed in that year. They just came up out in the open on the balance sheets because of RBI's AQR. And the overall NPA in the banking system was as high as 11%. Public sector banks, it was 20% of total loans. Now, by any definition, this would qualify as a banking sector crisis. But because we didn't have any bank run or bank failure, it doesn't qualify according to the official or the, the, the Western country definition of a banking crisis, because 70% of the banks are owned by the government. But what happened as a result of this twin balance sheet crisis was, if you look at just the, the dark graph, not the red one, the red one is still the NPA on the left-hand axis as a percentage of total loans, the black one shows you the ratio of risk-weighted assets in total assets of the banking sector, that steadily started declining from 2015 onwards, which essentially shows that the banking system became extremely risk averse as a result of the asset quality review and all the steps that were taken by the RBI and the government after that to penalize the banking sector. Prompt corrective action, putting public sector bank employees under the Prevention of Corruption Act, investigations by central agencies, that made the banks extremely risk averse. They steadily reduced the share of their risk weighted assets in total assets. And the way they did that, if you focus on the red bar, that is the share of industrial credit in bank credit. That, as you see, consistently went down. And on the top, you see the dark yellow. That is the share of consumer credit in total credit. That went up. So what the banks did in response to this NPA crisis was they started moving away from the riskier industrial loans and started moving towards lower risk weight carrying consumer loans. And this was extremely important. All of this happened before the ILFS default took place, right? And this is also the time when the bank started lending to NBFCs because NBFCs carry a 20% capital buffer. And that provides a buffer against the last def borrower default. So for banks, it was safer to lend to the NBFCs rather than lending to the industries. So that is how the whole, whole thing transpired. So these are some numbers which will essentially tell you that Given that India is a bank-dominated economy, the share of bank credit in total credit went down from more than 70% to 63% before the ILFS default happened. And by 2017, bank credit was growing at a decade's low of less than 9%. Share of industry went down, share of consumer lending went up. This was the first time this kind of reallocation of bank credit had happened, which was a pretty significant structural shift given that the banking sector commands more than 65% of total commercial credit. This shows you the deleveraging that happened on the other side, the, the, the firm balance sheets who were stressed. They started retiring the debt and didn't take any fresh loans. So debt equity ratio, debt to asset ratio, which is what I show here, consistently started falling from 2015 onwards, again, before the ILFS default happened. The net result of all of that was that this started showing up in private sector investment, one of the key drivers of GDP growth. 
So this is a, a data a graph on private sector projects for all industries under implementation, which sort of is a proxy for the extent of investment activity going on in the economy. And as you can see, that steadily started declining from 2011, 12 onwards, and continued to decline, never really recovered. The, the gray lines show the, the recession periods in India according to the old uh, GDP data. And this is a graph of the announcement of new projects in the private sector, which is a proxy for worsening business sentiment, nominal levels, against consistently declining from 2011-12. There was a bit of a pickup uh, in 2014, election year, and then it again continued to decline much before the ILFS default, right? And again, as I said, given that investment is a very important driver of growth, there are many, many such indicators which will tell you that growth started showing problems much before 2019-20. So this brings me to the, the second uh, 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 comment, which is, it's a very big, lengthy paper, but then what's the main question or what's the main topic of the paper, right? On one hand, there's a very wide focus because he talks about policy actions during the pandemic, the, the restoration of the health of the financial system, growth strategy, digital revolution, and all of it. And strangely enough, it's also narrow in its focus because it gives the, a lot of emphasis on the default of the two NBFCs and the events that happened after that. So if I look at the title, it's the past and future of Indian finance, but Indian finance is not just about non-banks, or even institutions, there are markets as well. And the paper is strangely silent about the bond market and the equity market, right? Um, and also that the focus is on a very narrow period, not really a long uh, sweep of history. So a couple of suggestions. Uh, maybe he may want to reorient the paper. So either make it a paper about India's institutional credit landscape, because it doesn't talk about financial markets much at all, at least the way it has evolved over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, there also his focus is mainly on the non-banks, mentions the banking sector on the passing, doesn't talk about the very critical role played by private equity and venture capital funds, which have played a very important role in the deleveraging of firms by infusing fresh capital, but that's missing. Insurance companies and pension funds, very important role in the bond market as suppliers of capital, that's missing. Emergence of private credit funds, which is gradually picking up in India, the alternative investment funds, he doesn't talk about that as well. So you may want to plug in some of these points and make, a paper, make, it, make it a paper about institutional credit landscape, or just remain focused on the NBFC crisis and its ramifications without going into all of the wider issues of pandemic and financial system reforms, et cetera. And as if he decides to, to refocus the paper, it will be useful to keep in mind that there is an extensive literature that exists in India on this topic. Several papers and articles I have co-authored myself. There are many other people who have written extensively on it on all of these topics. Um, and it will be useful for him to dig deeper into this literature uh, to figure out where he wants to add value. Final point, uh, there are some important gaps which, which I'll share with him as well. Uh, for example, it gives a lot of focus on real estate. Yes, it is a problem. But in terms of exposure of NBFCs and banks, infrastructure exposure is significantly important than real estate exposure. There are problems with roads, ports, power, aviation. We, we heard the power sector uh, paper yesterday. In fact, when the bankruptcy law came about, the 12 largest cases that the RBI had pushed to the bankruptcy reform were all in the infrastructure sector, not in the real estate. Um, and very important to keep in mind that by 2020, bank credit growth was down to less than 6% which was a six decade low. And this is a bank dominated economy. So you can't move away from the very important role played by the banking sector crisis and only focus narrowly on the NBFC default. Um, very important post pandemic trend since he talks about post pandemic is increased consumer lending and reduced lending to industries. In fact, the RBI in its latest financial stability report has raised concerns about the rise of unsecured retail lending in the banking sector. Again, something that, that, that's missing in the paper. If on the other hand, he wants to make it a paper about the NBFC crisis, it's important to keep in mind that these NBFCs are not a monolith in India. Depending on their size and ownership pattern, they were differentially impacted by the ILFS default. The top 20 to 25 NBFCs, which account for about 70% of NBFC loans, they were not really that much impacted. They still had access to the bond market. Yes, the cost of borrowing in the bond market went up because credit spreads widened, but they could also get lending from the banking sector. All that they did was reduce their own lending. The main problem was in the small and medium-sized NBFCs, which in any case could not access the bond market, 
but they also lost access to bank funding. Now that complex nuance is missing in the analysis of the paper. And it's important to know that by middle of 2019, the liquidity situation in the system was back to normal. So even if there was a liquidity problem, it lasted not more than one, one, one and a half years. And very important, let me last but one slide, very important to note and ask the question, which, which the chief somehow misses is, why did the NBFCs fail, right? It's not just a question of asset liability mismatch. Unsustainable credit growth and the role of credit risk assessment, also applicable to the banks, it's missing in the paper. That needs urgent attention. Privatization is not an answer. Providing liquidity from the RBI is not an answer. Because the NBFCs were private, a very big bank which ran into problem is private. So what's the role of credit risk assessment? We don't hear that in the paper. Role of lack supervision by the RBI of NBFCs. These are not shadow banks in the sense they don't exist in the shadow. They are regulated and supervised by the RBI, but the RBI in its financial stability reports in the run up to ILFS default didn't spend more than one paragraph on NBFCs in terms of supervision, right? And then they had a knee jerk reaction and started regulating the NBFCs like banks. Doesn't really work. So that needs much more attention in the paper. There's some other minor points. So last slide, a lot of good material in the paper, but I think there's a need to sharpen the focus um, and, and plug in the gaps, mm -hmm. and also try to understand where he can add value in context of the very big literature that exists in India uh, on all of these topics. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajshree. They, they were really excellent comments. And uh, on this the issue of the title of the paper, I, that's my, that was my first reaction. It's keep it narrow, talk about it. Uh, it, it, it's better. Uh, so let me open the floor for really for discussion and comments as unfortunately the author is not here and my colleagues I'm sure and some of you may be able to answer the questions that are raised. Arvind, please. Poonam, after. Hey, um, just two or three very quick questions. Uh, one, you know, this withdrawal of the CDR um, in 2015, wasn't it a bit late? I mean, uh, I had a student, you know, who was from engineering coming to s do a course on Indian economy in public policy school, who in fall 2013 wrote a paper on this, alerted, I mean, that's the first, I, so by 2013 fall, even I knew that this was boiling up. Uh, 2014, actually, in an India Today long article, I wrote about this. Uh, why was the RBI waiting till 2015? And even then to start with this AQR and all, isn't it late because the action should have happened right away. What happened in 2017 should have been started in 2015. So that's my question number one. Uh, to, uh, to Rajeshwari's yeah. comments, excellent comments by the way, comments were both superb. Um, to Rajeshwari, I think, in fairness, I think banking crisis is something a lot of people have written a lot about. And, and, and the new thing, at least I found in Ruchi's paper, was, the f was this whole analysis of the non-bank finance uh, companies. But, but your point is absolutely right, that, that this process is ongoing for a much longer period and the banking crisis is in the background of everything else that is happening. So with that part, I agree. Now, coming to your comment, uh, which I don't think most of us had thought about, uh, uh, Ravi. Um, in the end, when, if one looks, I mean, I know this only superficially, but if I look at the solution that was then done to, to bring back the IL and FS, uh, uh, and perhaps the other one as well, uh, was it seems to me it was one of liquidity and not solvency, because it doesn't seem to me that the government actually put a lot of money into these. What they did was to bring uh, uh, the, the, some of the other banks to come in and buy equity in Ireland FS at a very low price. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, what, what um, uh, I mean, but eventually anyway, you know, once this happened, whatever uh, implicit subsidy may have been there goes back because, you know, the equity that they bought was at 10 rupees uh, uh, per share and the Share prices did rise well about 10 rupees. I mean, they already are are, are there, if I, if I understand correctly. So it seems no actual money was was in this sense uh, uh, injected. So so one 
suspects that perhaps it was a liquidity issue. So, those are my thoughts. Awesome. So wha why, why, Raj, why didn't you answer the first two questions and then? Yeah, so uh, you're absolutely correct. I think uh, many of us thought that not just CDR, RBI did a whole alphabet soup of restructuring schemes and continued till 2015. But I think the answer lies in the political economy of it. Given that 70% of the banks are owned by the government and the public sector bank NPA share was 20% of total loans, the moment you stop the restructuring schemes and force the banks to disclose the NPA, the banks will need a huge amount of capital to provide for the losses. And in this case, the capital would have to come from the government. So unless there is willingness from the government to recapitalize the banking sector, the RBI can only do so much and force the banks to disclose the NPA. So I think that is why the whole extend and pretend went on for as long as it did. And then at some point of time, it was pretty evident that the restructuring schemes were simply not working. And that's when even the RBI felt compelled to do the asset quality review. And then as we all know, all hell break loose because all of these banks were inadequately capitalized. And then it was a lot of uh, political economy uh, struggle going on to figure out how much capital the government can give to the banks. And the public sector banks actually had to take a lot of losses because when they went to the IBC, they had to accept very large haircuts without adequate capital. But, but, but wasn't RBI free to go ahead and 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 take take away the uh, restructuring much sooner that's th i don't think that's I mean, so we, we talk about the independence of the rbi and uh, there was so much of this attacks happening under the next governor urjit patel that somehow clearly the rbi did not have the discretion that we talked about uh, in the last session um the the, the second point about <coughs> yes nobody has written so much about this just two ways to answer so I have an Asian Development Bank working paper which talks exactly about the ILF's default crisis and what happened after that, which I'll share with Ruchit. Maybe he hasn't come across that. And the second point, yes, I will. And the second point is, it's not a question of who has written about what. It's a question of if your objective is to explain the economic slowdown of 2019-20 and the role of financial sector, then you have to take into account the events of the financial sector that led to the slowdown. Then if you redefine the objective as I only want to study the NBFC crisis, then just do that. So that's why I said reorient the focus of the paper, right? On the point of liquidity and solvency, if I can just take a one minute. First of all, RBI cannot directly inject liquidity into NBFCs. And it's not correct to say that RBI did that when COVID struck, because that's not true. Both after the global financial crisis, as well as after ILFS default, as well as in the pandemic, the RBI gave liquidity to the banks and told them to lend to the NBFCs. The RBI did a TLTRO operation, which is targeted long-term repo operation in the COVID times, when they gave liquidity to the banks and told them to buy bonds of NBFCs. So RBI legally cannot in directly inject liquidity into the non-banking sector. That did not happen. One thing that was a problem was mutual fund. They, they were the only ones we faced a liquidity crisis. RBI or, could not do a direct infusion of liquidity into mutual funds legally. That has changed now. Now there is a liquidity window which the mutual funds can access and get access to liquidity if there is a shock. Okay? And I don't think it was a solvency crisis either because other than ILFS, even DHFL did not really have a solvency problem. When it became Piramal and was taken over by the Piramal group, it started functioning very well and is doing perfectly fine today. I think ILFS was the only one which faced a solvency crisis and the liquidity crunch that happened in the bond market lasted from September 2018 to roughly July 2019. And after that, the spreads also came down till the pandemic hit. So it's a very short-lived liquidity crunch that we are talking about. Um, that's, that's excellent. I mean, I, look, I, the paper doesn't have these details about at what price the transfer to the new governance structure they put in place took place and what is the current valuation of that. I have no information on that. So I, it's good to know that it was mainly it's come back and the government didn't lose any money in it. So then uh, that's, that's great. Then it, it would look more like a liquidity event. And then the liquidity event means that they need a good mechanism to deal with this yeah. as and when it happens again. OK, okay like TAF in, 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 in the US. And so there are a lot of these mechanisms that need to be put in place. They may already be there, but that would be like the critical policy implication. I think Sarjit <coughs> Yeah. Uh, just two points perhaps on behalf of 
which is what I anticipate he might say. This, on the first point on liquidity versus solvency, I didn't quite get how you would identify a solvency crisis without a liquidity, or let me put it this way. I can see liquidity leading to a slowdown or lack of liquidity, high interest rates, but solvency leading to liquidity crisis, I somehow not able to understand. Second, so I can see the consequence one way or the relationship, but not the other. I think it's also unfair to say that the paper is only 2018 to 20. There's a very extensive discussion of what happened since about 2014 and leading up to, and obviously both in the charts and el elsewhere, uh, the asset quality review, which came much before that. And the author points out that, look, that had consequences. He didn't comment on whether that was necessary or not. I think he thinks it was necessary. But to say that this is only about 2018-20 um, is, I think, a bit incorrect. Thanks. Uh, no, no. Let, let's, let's just take some more questions. Um, uh, Martin, please. And I apologize, but I'm, this is very, very useful um, for me. I, I just wanted to comment on Sergit. I didn't understand what he said, but it seems to me pretty standard that if if people perceive a bank as insolvent, there are runs and that causes illiquidity. That's what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. Mm -hmm. It was perceived as insolvent by the way it was. Um, but anyway, you can comment on that. I, um, I thought this was a wonderful exchange and very, very informative. Um, so I have the following questions and one comment. Um, on the wider crisis that you referred to, my understanding is from you and other things I've read that a core element was the state of the balance sheets of the public sector banks. Um, my view has always been that in terms of loss recognition, and this is, I learned this when I was in the World Bank many decades ago, um, it's not been a problem I've been dealing with since, that loss recognition in public sector banks is pretty difficult for pretty obvious reasons. Politicians don't want to admit that this, is going to, this has happened and they don't want to be put on the hook for, um, uh, uh, for the capital increases that are normally required. I presume that was true here too. Um, does that problem, in your view, still exist? The second question, which is linked to that, is, is it reasonable, as some people have here have been telling me, to say that all this is over? That we now have a safe, solid Indian banking and financial system which will support growth? That seems to be a pretty big question. I'd be really interested in your view. Um, uh, and those are the two questions I have. Uh, on the, um, but I did want to say some, ask a question about this fascinating question, issue of how do you finance infrastructure? It, and now I've thought about this a lot and written a lot about it over the years and we've made, God knows, a lot of mistakes in my country and others. One of the core issues in my view pretty obviously, is the feasibility of, both practically and politically, of revenue capture. If you can capture revenue from whatever you're doing, then it becomes pretty easy to finance, and if you can't, you have a problem. And often that's a political more than a regulatory issue, and that's, I presume, related to what we were talking about on the electric power industry yesterday. So one... I'd like to link this to with one other discussion which I've written about for well, two and a half decades, which is property taxes. So a lot of infrastructure's in main impact is that it raises property prices in a very, very big way. Mm -hmm. And one easy, if it's successful, that's usually what it does. Not all, but roads and airports and all these sort of things. So one way of doing, getting revenue capture, if at least if the public sector is going to do the borrowing, and that's what the Chinese have done, is essentially capture it through, directly or indirectly, through land prices. Land prices or land rents, land taxes. I understand that's very problematic here, but I would love to know how far that is a factor or an issue in the Indian debate, because it does seem to me a pretty central and effective way of financing infrastructure. 
Thanks. of so funding the finance of infrastructure and funding come before finance. Nobody's going to lend money if nobody can pay them back. <laughs> so, so let me just, uh, uh, just to summarize, so uh, Martin's question has two parts. One relates to RBI, which you can try and answer. Uh, and the second is a, a really tough, tough question, which I really want to open to anybody who's an expert in this area. It doesn't necessarily have to be somebody from here. But on the first question and related, which is also s somewhat related to what Arvind mentioned, I mean, uh, just to clarify, it's not just about them recognizing that there are losses when they've already incurred. It's, it's an even bigger issue of whether there was proper risk assessment and th did the RBI know and ignore because of political reasons or they just didn't have the tools? So that's also an issue if, if you can shed light on would be great. Sure, so a short answer to Martin, your question is as long as there's government ownership of banks, this problem is going to continue, right? It's not gonna go away anywhere, irrespective of which sector the banks lend to. Um, earlier, the banks were lending to infrastructure and large companies. The public sector banks have completely shied away from that sector. And as I said, they have now lend they've been lending to, earlier the private sector banks were doing it, now even the PSU banks are doing it, they're lending to the retail consumer uh, sector, which they think is safe as of now, till we have the next problem. So connecting to your next question, all is well till all is not well, right? And that's how I think it works in India. Um, so I think the problem of industrial NPA is not going to occur for the next several years, simply because banks are not lending to industries, right? Now, we can look at glass half full and say, oh, because everything is healthy, or glass half empty, I say, but then where is industry going to get credit from? That's a separate question. Now, banks are lending a lot to unsecured retail, uh, home loans, car loans, education loans, et cetera. These are small ticket loans, so as of now, the problem isn't really looking like a very big chunk of the issue. But then, if there is, there's never been a consumer loan crisis in India, let me put it that way. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically one pocket of concern that I know the RBI is concerned about uh, and keeps highlighting in the financial stability report. Also, the, the MSMEs, the micro, small, and medium enterprises have gotten a big chunk of bank credit over the last three years because the government gave a credit guarantee, and now that credit guarantee is coming to an end. Currently, the MSME NP is around 5% of bank loan books, so not a very big deal. Also, there is a government guarantee to it, so we'll have to see how that pans out. So yes, things are looking much better now. The banks are much better capitalized. Uh, but it's also true that their entire lending portfolio has shifted. And which is in a way connected to your infrastructure financing point, which I don't want to answer because I don't know. But there is a lack of appetite for the banking sector to touch the risky assets like infrastructure or any other large industrial project. right? So, And we don't really have a very deep corporate bond market either. So where will that infra funding come from? The government has set up a development financial institution, the NAPFID. It is only financing the very good AAA rated projects. <laughs> Who finances the risky infrastructure projects? I don't know. Maybe somebody else will be able to answer that question. But I hope I was able to answer what you asked. OK, on Martin's second question, does anybody want to take up the challenge? Suruji Land does. Taxes? Huh? On the land tax. On, on where will it come from? When will <coughs> Look, revenue capture is a political economy problem. I completely agree that taxation of illegal profit, not illegal, supernormal profits, often <laughs> 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 are, is the correct way to go. I happen to believe that. And I think. You know, you have rents created, extra normal profits created through infrastructure around the world. And as economists and um, as policy advisors or those who feel they want to give policy advice, I think this is very much the way to go. And I wouldn't be surprised if there would be some elements of it because it's by now well recognized around the world. Um, infrastructure is needed. Infrastructure creates a political economy problems of rents, of bailouts, and uh, we need a market mechanism, which goes back to what the earlier discussion was uh, in order to correct for it. And I 
as a one-armed economist, I, I don't think we need to go through ifs and buts. Martin, on, on China, it's not a fair comparison because in, in China, nobody can own land. It's all 99 year leases or whatever. They can own the house, but not the land. So all the benefits go to the local governments, the provincial governments. So it's a different model, so to speak. Um, you know, I think Poonam has a question. Ram, can you be? No, no, don't wait. Do it fast. One oh, minute. Oh, oh, what a privilege. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ram. So could I respond to sure. the infrastructure uh, funding model? You know, so one is the political economy constraint, uh, which is that uh, the property tax or land tax, uh, if at all, it can be levied, imposed by municipalities and state government. To that extent, uh, the federally funded projects uh, do not have uh, that lever to, to exercise. But you know, one could uh, think of uh, some innovations. For example, when you are thinking of funding a road or railway projects, you go for overtakings of land. You could uh, you know, take away and use, you know, then you rent out. Uh, so, and we have done some experiment with that. For example, Delhi Airport is an example. So the, what we call hospitality sector is part of the project and this part of the project is used uh, for co-funding of uh, what is main airport. Another example would be what we call Yamuna Expressway or Taj Expressway when you travel from here to, to Taj. That project was funded by JP Group. It has five townships as a part of the, the project that were also used uh, you know, uh, that's also, uh, the problem with these mechanisms is that to use these mechanisms, you need to have very detailed, a uh, very carefully designed contract with private sector. And generally public sector, there's a perception that public sector gets shortchanged. Uh, and as a result, you know, there's some risk aversion among policymakers to go down that path. Uh, Thanks very much, Ram. I, I think there's a question from Poonam, and then there's another one from Charan. I cannot say no to you, Manmeet. So <laughs> can, can, can we go all, maybe five minutes extra? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah? And so um, yeah. actually, uh, and I'll give the last comments one to and Surjit. questions, given hmm. that I'm one of the co-editors of the journal, where the paper will go. And we don't have the author, but we have surrogate authors here. <laughs> and uh, we had deliberately brought Rajeshwari because we were given some idea that Ruchir may not be able to make it. So you're doing that role very, very well, Rajeshwari. So one quick comment is on infrastructure finance. What we are calling infrastructure finance today will also be called climate finance very soon. And similar issues, who will pay for climate finance? And, uh, Martin suggested one idea, which is property tax. And yesterday, we also talked about privatization of assets owned by the states. I don't know how large they are and how easy they are, and whether there is a case also for financial intermediation, which seems very, very hard. So it's both a question of financing, and then how does that get uh, financing get intermediated? But on a broader question, Rajesh, your comment on the paper being very large and not being sufficiently focused. I haven't read the paper, it being so long, it uh, deters you. Um, but so in your comments and Suji's presentation, it came out that the paper has also focused on the slowdown during 2019-20. And your questions about when should that period start and so on. So actually we had, uh, at NCR, we had written a paper on slowdown in 2019-20, Enigma or an anomaly. I hope the authors have cited it, otherwise we'll remind him. Um, there we have actually three hypotheses and three contributing factors. We carefully looking at the data, because that was the only focus of the paper, drilling down to the last available data point and uh, disaggregation. Uh, we decided that it was an anomalous year, that banking sector issues did not figure in in an additional contributing factor that year. NBFC sector certainly, but there were two other factors. COVID started impacting economic activity in the last quarter of that year. And things, as things started closing down, even though it was concentrated in like a month and a half or two months, it had a significant impact on economic growth. Um, and the third factor was slowing uh, global trade that year. 
which we quantified added a significant amount as well. So we will send these comments uh, to the author, but they will also be recorded here. So no questions to answer. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, shall, shall we take Charan's question? Yeah. yeah. Charan. This is in reaction to what Martin said. I happen to chair a public sector bank, Martin, with 1,500 branches and 900 ATMs. It's a government-owned bank. When you were here in your earlier stint earlier, we used to have development institutions in terms of IDBI. Even ICIC in the private sector was doing lots of lending. Then we went for Universal Bank and all those got, got merged. You already know HDFC is doing a reverse merger now. During this phase, it was the public sector banks who did lots of infrastructure financing. Actually, the phase of NPAs which came in recent years was mainly because we had, the public sector banks had gone extraordinarily large into the infrastructure financing. Because our people in the banking industry were really commercial banks and not trained to be doing commercial viability of infrastructure projects, NPAs were rising. It is then that many of us raised our concerns and the government then came out with the infrastructure bank, which is the NABFID, which Professor mentioned. So the point that I'm trying to make is, Professor could be right, half glass full, half empty, but the role of the public sector banks in the rising NPAs that happened was basically because of their lending intently, deliberately into infrastructure financing. The movement that happened from infrastructure to retail, which Professor, you are mentioning now, is a very recent one. And when we get into housing, we consider it a highly collateralized loan. We do not consider it as, as an education loan. Just wanted this clarification. Thank you. Great. Manish? I just want to disagree with Rajeshwari, building on Arvind's comment about discretion and about the fact that you did not recognize bad loans in state-owned banks because you had to recapitalize them, right? Co Corporate lending of state-owned banks went from 18 lakh crores to 52 lakh crores between 2008 and 2014 because there was a tone from the top. I even took it up with Montek when he said yesterday, oh, how will we finance infrastructure if banks don't give money? And there was a tone from the top at RBI that if you don't give regulatory forbearance, infrastructure will not get built. That was a tone from the top at RBI. It was mm. not from the outside. So it was voluntarily that corporate credit in nationalized banks went from 18 lakh crores to 52 lakh crores. That was above the speed limit. And as far as recognizing, we publicly declared that um, IDBI has 30% NPAs. There was no change in their deposits. See, this liquidity and solvency problem is only there with private sector banks. <laughs> liquidity is a solvency crisis immediately. In public sector banks, you can declare that you have 40% non-performing loans and your deposits don't change. So there was no constraint of coming out with the truth for public sector banks because depositors don't care anyway. They think, they, they, I mean, they think that 89 lakh crores of nationalized bank deposits are a sovereign guarantee. So it's not fair to say there was no discretion. It was not fair to say that they were not brought on top of the table because the government said, I don't have the money to capitalize it. Can I just have one minute? No, no. I, I, I think this is after now. Uh, I have to be firm. Uh, Banish, we'll talk offline on this. Then. Yeah. I think one has to distinguish between the, the RBI and the, and the government, for sure. But, but you can talk uh, later on. I. I, you know, we are beyond the time, and Surjit wants to say something. No, no, I'll, I'll just go, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Could, could anyone uh, comment on when financial crisis happened, who's actually accountable? We don't have no. financial crisis Sorry. in India. Central bank. This. We, we should talk about, about the only the, the only reason I ask this question is that are banks strong today? Well, if we don't know how to hold someone accountable for that, it'll happen again and again. So who's accountable for these crises? The, the short answer is it depends where the problem was. So, but we can discuss that. Uh, Surjit, no, just very briefly on. Last I wanted word. to mention the the important uh, question and point raised by Martin. You know, 
the special problem of India, and you've studied India more than most people, we don't even have any taxation of agriculture in India. Land tax, property tax, and a lot of the infrastructure is happening in the rural areas. So I think we've got an additional set of problems uh, than what, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't proceed. But I just wanted to point that out. I've yet to recognize how 77 years after independence, we still believe that agriculture should not be taxed. Thank you very much. This really was a rich discussion. I want to thank Surjit again and also Ravi and Rajeshwari for making it all very exciting for us. And we can continue further. I, I'm sure Poonam has organized fantastic tea like last, like yesterday. Uh, Thank you.